Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Rob Green of AMD. We're going to drill down today into video compression. Rob, how far has video compression gotten today, and is it actually changing? So video compression is, is everywhere um, across all markets. Um, I look after the pro EV and broadcast markets, um, and compression is one of those technologies which is used to reduce bandwidth and reduce storage. Um, and, and obviously a lot of customers in broadcast and professional AV want to save money. They want to get the highest quality video that they can through the network, um, but it is all really about balancing that quality uh, versus cost. So there's been a lot of innovation happening over the years um, from customers and from standards bodies to improve the capabilities of video compression for lots of different use cases. And this is all about this rise in data, right? Because now you have so much data, but your bandwidth has always been limited. Yeah, it, it's about video data. So the progression to larger frame rates where you move from 4K to 8K, that's starting to happen at the moment. That's an exponential rise in the number of pixels that you have to communicate or to transport. On top of that, you've also got higher dynamic range. So HDR on top of that uh, video pipeline. You've got wider color gamuts, um, which take a lot more data, um, as well as having faster frame rates potentially for some use cases where you're going from 30 frames a second to 60, maybe even 120 frames per second in esports or, or um, gaming applications. So all of that added together means that you've got a vast amount of data that needs to be transmitted now over a network or to be stored in an archival system. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Rob, what are we looking at? Sure, so we're looking at uh, the progression of video technologies and this pursuit of a more immersive and realistic experience that in, in pro EV and broadcast we're seeing as a consumer pull. So we're seeing larger frame rates. We're moving from HD to 4K and 8K and some of the new TV sets that are out in the stores, they're all uh, starting to appear uh, as 8K sets. We see faster frame rates, as I mentioned, in gaming um, and esports, deeper color gamuts, um, so wider color and, and a more lifelike experience on screen, and HDR, which gives you a better contrast between light and darks. And all of that added together gives you a much more immersive and realistic experience when you're viewing content. The issue is with that is that the number of pixels and the number of frames, if you multiply all this together, the bandwidth and storage requirements are going up exponentially. So what we're seeing is that the interconnectivity between equipment that handles this kind of video content needs to use faster connectivity standards. So things like HD SDI has moved to 3 gig and 12 gig SDI over time. Um, DisplayPort has moved from version 1.1 to 1.2 and now 1.4 and HDMI is now at version 2.1 of the standard. And all of these are built to handle faster video data rates. The issue is that as these get faster, the distances that the cables can carry this content over become much shorter. So you're starting to see the adoption of video over IP or AV over IP networks. So things like IPMX and 702110 are standards that we see in broadcast and pro AV. Uh, but generally, a lot of people are starting to stream video content over Ethernet. And that really needs different types of compression for it to work properly. There are some uncompressed versions of uh, AV over IP, but generally we're seeing compressed streams starting to become more of the norm across all kinds of use cases. And that might be the lossy codecs, the MPEG-based standards, uh, MPEG-2, H.264, H.265, or it could be the intermediate or mezzanine codecs. These are the lightweight compression schemes like JPEG-2000, TCO, VC2, uh, and so forth. And all of this combination of moving to IP and compressed streams means that we can now start to go wider area. We're not just in the studio anymore or in the control room we can now transmit that over a wider area network or over the internet to anywhere in the world. 
And also you can now ingest this video content into the cloud and data center applications can start to do more scalable video processing for things like streaming, Netflix, Hulu, those guys are using data centers. And all of that is enabled by compressed streams and the move to packetized video over IP. And this becomes even more intense as we go forward, right? Because we're now getting into AR and VR. So we're dealing with much more data than we've had in the past. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it, it, this is the kind of application where faster frame rates comes in because your eye is very close to a screen in the headset. Um, and that means that the frame rates have to speed up considerably. And because your eye is right up against the screens, the tiny screens, but because you're so close to them, the fidelity has to be really high. And that drives not only the video data rates, but also things like latency. You have to have very low latency processing. You have to have uh, very synchronized video and audio across the network or back to the base station. Uh, but yeah, it, it really is one of the drivers. VR and AR are starting to build the requirement for higher data rates for video. When you look at this part of the market, it's always been a confusing array of acronyms as well as codecs. There's codecs for almost everything and lots of different codecs to choose from. How do you choose that? What, what are you looking for when you choose a codec? It's a really good question. I, I think there are so many codecs to choose from. And historically, it's always been the same. You know, this timeline here is from 1990 when codecs started to really appear as standardized technologies and very simplistic in their, the things like motion JPEG were essentially series of still images. So like the old cinema projectors from the 20s, you know, this is not particularly scientific in the way that it compressed data, but it was the start of a chain of events which led to lots of people innovating. And part of the reason we have so many codecs is because the standardization of codecs is really about the decode side, not the encode. There is a lot of ways to get to a compressed video stream. It's led to lots of innovation and lots of companies like Avid and Apple that you see here, they created their own versions of lightweight compression streams for studio equipment and for post-processing and post-production. So we're starting to see uh, this tail continue as new video data rates come out, the 4K, the 8K and the new formats that I talked about, they require more compression to get over the same network or more capabilities and features and profiles within that codec space to do to handle different use cases. And what we've got here is bifurcated somewhat. So the light green at the top here is all the lightweight codecs, the mezzanine or intermediate codecs, which have really come out of the post-production side of the business but they're starting to be used as connectivity codecs. So it's a, a very lightweight compression ratio, maybe three to one down to 12 to one compression. So it's fairly lightweight, but that gives you enough compression to get over a one gigabit ethernet link or a 10 gigabit ethernet link, uh, even up to 4K, even 8K uh, video today. So things like Tico, Calibri, high throughput JPEG 2000 and JPEG XS, these are the kind of uh, lightweight compression that we see in professional media systems today. And they all essentially do the same thing. They squeeze the information down lightly so that it will get onto the network bandwidth that you have available. But the way that they do that is very innovative and very uh, proprietary to the providers of those technologies in the industry. There are two trends going on here, one of which is that you're sending all the raw data and you're processing it at the other end and you really have to compress that because you have a lot more data than you did in the past. The second thing that's happening is more of it's moving to the front end where you're doing some processing right there and sending less data. It's almost like you're eliminating the, the trash part of the data that you don't need, right? Yeah, the, the reason that there are two lots of codecs is we've talked about the lightweight compression that tends to be all of the upfront video processing that you're talking about right from the camera. So, or even right from the sensor within the camera, we're starting to see these kind of lightweight compression schemes come into play. And once that gets through post-production and all the way up to the head end, 
then it becomes a, a switch almost to some of these heavy compression schemes that are listed underneath. So the MPEG based distribution codecs, uh, VP9 for uh, YouTube encoding, for example, and newer compression schemes like H.264, 265, AV1 is starting to make an appearance, as well as the new MPEG standards, MPEG-5 and H.266. And all of these are really built for very low bit rate uh, or relatively low bit rate uh, distribution to lots of consumers in the market. So you've got this upfront video processing and video uh, codec schemes, which are lightweight, and they try to keep the video as pristine as possible throughout the workflow. And then you get to the head end and send it out to hundreds or millions of consumers, depending on the channel. And that's where the heavy compression starts to come in. And while you're setting up these systems, you now have extra things that you have to think about, right? Because are you sending that much better quality video along and that's already been edited and this is exactly what you want? Or are you sending the, the raw footage and you don't necessarily know all those pieces? Yeah, it's very much dependent on the use case, and, it, and it's always a trade-off, regardless of the codec, whether it be a lightweight mezzanine compression or one of the heavier MPEG-based codecs that we talked about. It's a trade-off dependent on the use case. So some examples here, and these are kind of approximations. Some use cases will have different levels of importance. But here we've got five parameters that we track. Video quality, which you mentioned, the compression ratio, the amount of compression, so the, the available bit rate, for example. The latency is going to be more important in some applications than others. So if you've got video conferencing, then latency is much more important than if you're watching a serial drama at home, for example. So those have different parameters too. And then you've got the implementation parameters, cost and power. So you can spend a huge amount of money and get excellent video quality and latency, but that's not something that's going to be used by a lot of consumers in their applications. That would be something that would be found maybe in a few rack units in the head end. So all of these use cases that you see here have different balances or different shapes of importance um, where it's a trade-off between these things, video quality, compression, cost, latency, and power. Does it matter which bit rate you're using in terms of, okay, I've got a, a great camera setup, I have high def versus somebody else who has a low def camera that they're receiving it on or, or screen. Do you necessarily want to send the best or do you want to send what's useful for them and where does it get translated into whatever's the best for it? It depends on the, the speed of the network that you can afford or the, the amount of storage that you have available. So if you've got a very wide bandwidth pipe, so if you've got a broadcast contribution link from an outside broadcast truck back to the studio, that's probably going to be a dedicated link, very high bandwidth availability, so you can get very good quality video through there and it's all professional. If you're working at home with your video conferencing system, it's unlikely that we've all got one gigabit Ethernet going around our home. So we're looking at very low bitrate implementations and a different type of compression scheme for that kind of thing. Although the latency is still going to be important. It's, it's really a balance. The choice would be made on the least significant bit of your decision, if that makes sense. So wherever the narrowest part of the pipeline is going to be, that's probably going to limit your overall transmission capabilities and will ultimately decide which kind of compression scheme you would use. Has it always been like this? Has it always been we have all these different choices and we're choosing the best one? Or are we now filled with lots of different choices because we have so much diversity in the pipes, the and equipment on the uh, send side as well as on the receiving side? I think there is more variety now because there are more people trying to solve the problem and the usage of video and the consumption of video content has become so widespread now. It's really the main communication method that we're all using from the mobile phone through to streaming online and watching movies from distribution providers to, you know, streaming YouTube, Facebook content, that kind of thing. So it's, it's become more democratized. The video is everywhere and more and more providers are starting to implement video provision um, as part of their services. Um, but it does mean that there are 
more innovators and more types of codec that are available, it, it can be a bad thing because you also want to have some level of interoperability. You don't necessarily want to have to have every single codec available in your system so that you can accept whatever is coming in. Uh, so it's really a, an end-to-end -end choice that most providers will have to make. If you own both ends of the network, then you can be a bit more laser focused on what type of compression you use rather than something which is more open and, and would use lots of different providers and consumers. A lot of this comes down to bit rates, right? I mean, really how fast you're moving this data and how large the individual chunks of data are. That's correct. Yeah. There are different types of codecs for different bit rates, depending on the use case. So I've tried to capture that here. Um, to show that you're really talking about lossy versus lossless codecs or kind of lossless codecs. By lossy, we mean that we're throwing a lot of the video content away. So the quality tends to be much less on the left-hand side of this picture compared to the right-hand side, but then the bit rate is much less and the things like mobile phone broadcasts would need a, a much lower bit rate than something which has got a dedicated 10 gigabit per second or even 100 gigabits per second network link in a studio. Um, so on the left hand side, you're, because the bit rates are so low in things like distribution from a broadcaster to your house or contribution from a sports stadium back to the new center, or if you're looking at uh, doing post-production or cinema acquisition systems, you, you can afford a lot higher bandwidth. When you get into the studio, or in the, the broadcast facility, you don't necessarily need to throw so much away. So you start to look at the higher bit rates of one gig, two and a half gigabits, or even 10 gigabit ethernet, maybe more. You can see here clearly that the, the lossy codecs are, were mainly used for wider distribution, wider area networks, where you've got to go over an internet style of communication. So mobile distribution, contribution, these are using long, or wide area network links that typically cost a lot of money to implement. So you tend to pay by the amount of bit rate that you have available, and that limits the amount of bit rate that people want to pay for. And therefore your choice of codecs is, is kind of limited to these MPEG style or AV1 kind of codecs. Whereas on the right hand side, you don't want to throw away too much of the video content because you're doing post-production, for example, in a cinema environment, if you start to throw stuff away, you never get it back. And, and that means that you're doing lightweight compression as, as little as you can get away with, but enough to be able to use a 10 gigabit pipe for maybe a 12 gig SDI stream, for example. So there, there's a very clear uh, delineation around the 300 megabit per second mark where the uh, lossless mezzanine compression schemes start to come into play. Uh, versus the lossy codex on the left-hand side for the lower bit rates. Another angle of this is there's a lot of new applications that really haven't done a lot with video or even audio in, in the past. You think about automotive, for example, they're starting to move into more video. You think about surveillance cameras, those are a lot more higher definition. They're faster than what they were in the past. How does all this fit together? That's true, yeah. So we, we see video everywhere. And I think you mentioned automotive, that's becoming a, an, an almost mobile phone on wheels these days. It's taking in a lot of visual information for pedestrian detection, adaptive driver assistance systems um, and surround view cameras. All of this is collecting lots of video information that needs to be passed around the car. So this would be typically a where the lightweight compression would come into play because it's a local area network and you want to keep that visual quality high and the latency very low. It's, it's an automotive, maybe a, a collision avoidance system. You know, those kind of things will need very low latency, very high quality to make decisions. You've also got other areas like surveillance you mentioned. You probably have a much less priority on video quality. You want to get lots of camera feeds coming into a cloud-based system so that you can then do machine learning on it. That would tend to be more of the H.264, H.265 codex. And that's because it is creating a much lower bitrate environment, but you've got many more channels of video that you want to support over a single connection link, for instance. Um, and what I'm showing here is 
a typical use case that we see, and part of this is enabled because we have a programmable hardware and software technology now. A lot of codecs can be done in software, but if you want to do it in real time and you want to do it low latency, it tends to be done in hardware accelerators like AMD offers. So we have HDMI and DisplayPort here on the left-hand side. This is baseband video coming in. We have devices that are capable of supporting both the lightweight compression schemes, and they can be programmed depending on who the provider is. You can develop your own mezzanine codec. It's a, a programmable platform. Um, and we also have embedded IP for H.264, H.265. So even though there are lots of codecs in the ecosystem, the platforms exist now that you don't have to worry about so much about which choice to make. You can kind of develop that and explore that and evaluate the trade-offs that we talked about between video quality, latency, and cost, et cetera, uh, using something like this Zinc UltraScale Plus platform, for example. It looks as if we now have lots of choices that we didn't have in the past. You have processing up front, you have processing at the, the receiving end, you've got po all these possibilities for basically upscaling, downscaling, whatever you're trying to do. How do you figure out what's the best choice for whatever you're trying to develop? So the, the great thing with video is that you can look at it on a screen and make a choice pretty quickly as to whether it's going to see your needs or not. And that can be the video quality. You know, you have people that have really trained in video quality artifacts and they can detect whether a codec is good or not, just by looking at the output from, on a screen. You can also measure latency, so you can implement a codec in your hardware on the bench, have a couple of screens with a source and a sync, and you can measure very quickly what the latency is for that particular codec. And it, again, always depends on your use case. You will have a set of parameters that will define what your latency parameters need to be, and also what your bitrate requirements are, and also the amount of cost that you're willing to spend on implementing some kind of compression scheme. And, and it's all really about evaluations um, and getting a lot of evaluation of IP of different codec providers and doing a, a shootout. In most cases, they, they actually do shootouts between different codecs uh, and, and can quickly make a choice because it's a visual. Rob Green, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome, Ed. It's been great talking with you. Thanks.